Welcome to the Art Stop. I'm Lucy Aron. I'm a museum educator. And today we're in the Art of East Asia, as you know. I'm very excited about this. We all are very excited about this reinstallation. As you may know, this gallery was, went a complete overhaul, redid the floors, redid everything. It's a brand new installation, just opened on February 9th to coincide with the celebration of Chinese New Year, um, which is the year of the snake. So I'm um, pleased to talk today about Closet A we're going to focus on, and you're never going to be more excited in your life about Closet A because there are some very specific details and intricacies that I'm going to reveal to you today, which will hopefully make you a connoisseur and be able to appreciate the differences between the Closet A of China and that of Japan. So as educators, what we do is we provide resources and gallery interactives for people so that they can learn a little bit more about the art on view, interpret it, get some cultural context. So what we did in this exhibition, in this installation, if you have not already seen it, is we've created a couple of, and I, I say we, the education department, has created a couple of gallery interactives, such as forgeries that you can touch, um, that give you a little bit of a background on that. So you'll see those spread out through the exhibition. We also have a calligraphy station um, towards the back of this exhibition where you can practice the ancient art of Asian calligraphy. And then uh, my contribution is this handout, which is called Cultural Connections. And this is going to also kind of guide you into experiencing cloisonne between China and Japan. So I'm going to give you an extended and enhanced version of that today. So thanks for joining us. Uh, so before we go into the specific details and intricacies of the cloisonne, I just want to give you a little quick background about this technique and what it actually is. And I'm very fortunate today to have in my hand a piece of cloisonne that was lent to us by Richard, one of the docents, who obtained this in China and brought it back. Um, and I think this is going to be especially useful because, as you can see, the objects that I'm going to talk about first, which here are from China, are in this case and a little bit difficult to see, although you can come definitely take a closer look as, as we're talking. We'll uh, then move back and look at the cloisonne, which is a little easier to see in the uh, next room. Um, but how is it made? So it's actually a really intricate process and takes a great deal of time and focus because as you can see, most cloisonne has a lot of very small detailed work. So the way it's created is you start with a metal vessel, it's usually uh, copper, and an artist will lay these small pieces of wire, usually copper wire, into these cloisons, which means uh, it's French for um, compartments or separations. And I have here a, an image of somebody who is working on a piece of cloisonne, and they're laying these little metal wires with a small tool. So you can see this was, was a very involved process. So after these metal wires are laid, then what happens is the artist takes pieces of ground glass, in like a glass powder, puts them inside these cloisons, and then fires it in a kiln, and a very hot kiln, and that turns it into this shiny enamel. And then what they have to do, polish it, and sometimes repeat the process by laying the glass powder firing it again until the enamel built to, to a significant thickness. Then they would polish it, they would uh, gild the wire, um, and voila, your cloisonne. So it's a very difficult technique to learn. Um, and another thing I'll point out is a lot of people think that it actually originated in Asia, but actually Asia learned about it from the West. So um, cloisonne was an ancient craft, I believe ancient Egypt, they had this kind of art. And, um, and then Byzantium really refined the technique. So in I think about 12th century, um, Cloisonne reached a peak there. And then, of course, Byzantium being located um, strategically along the trade routes, the Silk Road um, to Asia and Europe, pieces of Cloisonne eventually found their way over to China. So China uh, then picked up this technique, and they got very good at it. So Chinese cloisonne is actually older than Japanese, and uh, we'll find out why the Japanese actually didn't pick up on this until later. Okay, so 
in this case right here, we have several objects that are Chinese. And most of the cloisonné was very, again, very intricate, very beautiful, so it served a decorative purpose, um, usually more than functional, but they were kind of used for ceremonial purposes. Most of them are vessels, uh, so vases, water pots. We have a water pot here, a fruit offering bowl, and a decorative censer, which would have been sort of like an incense holder. There's also a couple of other interesting objects which you can take a closer look at. There's a, a, a brush washer, of course, for dipping and washing your brush, for doing the art of calligraphy. Um, and then we have our lidded box in the form of a recumbent bull, otherwise known as Artie. So this is our new family program's mascot, you may see, and he's on the label here. Um, so we can start by looking at these examples, and these will tell us a little bit about how we can identify Chinese cloisonné. So there's a couple key things that most Chinese cloisonné exhibit. The first thing is that Chinese cloisonné remained very traditional throughout centuries of production. So a lot of the similar colors and motifs you'll see in Chinese cloisonné. Now we have a wide variety here in this case, so that may not be totally apparent to you. Um, but the colors are one thing. So this turquoise color was really the most common. Um, un undoubtedly they would use turquoise most of the time. There's the blues, and then of course the yellow, which if you are familiar with the significance of color in Asia, yellow was the color of the emperor. So we know whenever we see something that is yellow, it most likely belonged to the emperor, was created or commissioned by the emperor. So our, our bull there is yellow, and he's got spiral patterns and motifs on him. He's supposed to look very fierce, um, but he ends up just, I think, looking quite adorable. So uh, you know what I want to do is I want to pass this around so you can see um, a couple of details in a second. But the motifs that were quite common, of course, flowers. You see a lot of motifs from nature. Um, so you'll, you'll notice that on these, these objects. Uh, there's grapevines on one, <coughs> flowers, uh, petals, different motifs that were inspired by nature. So that, that was very common to both Chinese and Japanese. Cloisonné, and we see that on this face. Butterflies, again, very beautiful. The um, transient you know, qualities of nature and change and that sort of thing. Those were common, common themes in, um, in Asian arts. But one of the, the best ways to tell the difference between Chinese and Japanese cloisonné, and it's a little clue right here. If you look at the top of this vessel, there is a border that goes around the top. And we'll also see it on a couple objects in this case. Um, this border is specifically Chinese. So there's a, and I have, I'll pass that around so you can take a closer look. I have an image here so you can get a better idea of what I'm referring to. But this border was, is called Ruyi. And it's a, shaped in a clover, so a three semicircle pattern with a dot in the middle. And that was actually a symbol for the emperor's scepter. So the, emperor's, the head of the emperor's scepter was shaped in, like a clover. And that actually symbolizes a sacred fungus in China. So Chinese cloisonné will, if it, if it has this border, which not all of them do, that would be an indicator that it's Chinese. So that's the first thing you, I would look for. Um, so we have colors, we have motifs, and we have the border. We'll see the difference when we get over to the Japanese, what kind of different borders they used for theirs. Okay, so let's then think about now some of the um, techniques that the Japanese use. So um, I invite you to take a closer look and we will walk over here and transition. Okay, so now we're going to continue in Japan and these are quite easier to see because of this this case arrangement. So right off the bat, you're going to notice some major differences. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Why did Japanese cloisonné occur much later? As you may know, Japan was, was, uh, it had enforced these strict no trade um, laws so that you could not enter or leave Japan with, with goods. And this was because before the 19th century, Japan wished to remain traditional um, pure, keep the borders closed. So before the 19th century, they had never seen cloisonné. 
Once the borders opened for trade in the 19th century, these pieces of cloisonne started trickling in. Um, the samurai actually took to them, and of course the samurai in Japan were scholars, artists, uh, writers, so they, they mastered the craft of cloisonne first. It is believed the samurai found a piece of cloisonne, took it apart to study how it was made, and then took it from there. So the very first pieces of Japanese cloisonne mimicked that of the Chinese and looked very, very similar. Then they started taking it in a different direction. So they really started to strain technique. And why we think this happened is because there was a German scientist who lived in Japan and uh, his, his name was uh, Gottfried von Wagner. And he was invited to live in Japan in the late 19th century at the time the emperor invited him. And he introduced new techniques for um, chemistry and uh, all of the things that they, they could use, these techniques for creating cloisonne and expanding it. So at that point, it, they started, the Japanese cloisonne makers started really experimenting. So they used new techniques, um, one of which is the ability to lay the um, enamel without the use of wire. So you'll notice in this, this vase right in the center, the moon with the soft clouds and the cherry blossoms, there's no wire separating out the, the images here. Okay. So that was one technique that the Japanese innovated. Another is the use of, uh, of uh, alternative materials in, in the glass. So we can see in this phase, you notice some other colors and you actually see um, a metallic substance, so like a gold stone. So they used um, metal oxides and other materials to create these different effects. The colors are also quite different, so um, not keeping with the traditional blues and turquoise and yellow. Instead, in the Japanese, you tend to see sometimes these dark greens, um, dark reds, teals. These lovely little vases here have all these different shades of grays, blues, purples. So the colors really started to vary as well. Another thing I'll point out, which is difficult to see, but after, after we're done, if you take a peek at the top of this vessel right here and look at the inside, Japanese cloisonne makers like to keep the texture really rough and bumpy. So Chinese cloisonne makers would polish uh, their insides of their vessels until they were completely smooth, whereas the Japanese sometimes left that orange peel texture, which is they just desired to leave it looking a little rougher. So you can notice that on the inside of that vessel if you're tall and can peek over the top. So back to the, the issue of the border. Um, you may need a microscope, but in these small vessels right here, you will notice there's, there's a very unique uh, Japanese technique for borders, which are tiny, tiny circles. And the tinier the circle along the border, usually at the top or the bottom of the vessel, the tinier the circle, the better the quality. So these two right here specifically have very, very, very small circles um, encircling the rim of the vessel. Okay, and so the, those will be very hard to see, but that would be another thing you could look for to identify um, Chinese versus Japanese. The motifs and nature um, and beauty in nature, the cherry blossom was very, very popular um, as a motif. Of course, in Japan, the cherry blossoms bloom. They don't last very long. They're quite gorgeous, but then all, all of a sudden they, the cherry blossoms will fall away and you'll be left with bare trees. So the Japanese very much appreciated that aesthetic of changes in nature and impermanence. So there's the, the cherry blossom and the moon, just really beautiful scenes from nature. And if you're wondering what the back of this vessel may look like, because we can only see one side here, I had uh, the good fortune to come across our uh, uh, head preparator, Jim Gilo, as he was preparing this piece for installation. And he allowed me to snap a photo. And here it is. This is the reverse of that, of that vessel. And it's, it's quite gorgeous. It's actually a, a, a water scene. So you have the, the houseboats in Japan, and they're floating, and there's, there's lanterns. 
So it's just, you know, just to give you a sense of what, what's going on on the other side of that vessel. So it's a shame in the sense we can't walk around all of the way, but, you know, well, which side is more beautiful, I don't know. Um, but the site is quite exquisite as well. Other motifs that will help you to identify and explain the significance of these vessels. Uh, the dragon, quite common to both China and Japan. So this vessel on the end has a dragon looping across the top here. Um, and then there's another uh, animal here which at first I thought was a crane because a crane is also a common motif or symbol. This actually is not, it is a hobird, which is a uh, phoenix, not to be confused with the western phoenix that rises from the ashes. This is a different symbol and the hobird or hoho bird, sometimes it's called, um, the Japanese phoenix um, is a symbol that uh, signifies a new age, um, peace. It, only comes out every so often and only when there is uh, something very beneficial happening such as the birth of a new emperor that will lead um, this country into years of good luck and fortune. So if you see the hoho bird that means that you're in for some magical years. However, if the hoho bird, um, and this is of course according to legend, um, if the hoho bird hides from you or goes away that means you're in trouble. Um, so that means there will be misfortune or something bad will happen. Um, the the hobird and the dragon are usually shown together. So the dragon is the more male um, symbol, the hobird the more female. So um, they play with each other. They, they there's there's a complex relationship here. They they um, signify you know wedded bliss in some ways, but then also just the opposite of that. So. <laughs> Whenever you see those two together, that's, that's uh, now you know kind of what that means. There's also, according to the legend of the hoe bird, um, it would go and nest in uh, polonia trees, I believe I'm saying that correctly. And there's actually a symbol here, which you can see when you get a closer look, and it's, it's three leaves with a branch. That is the uh, female emperor, empress symbol. So the Paulonia leaves, the three leaves with the, the stalk. And you can see it here to the left of the hobird and also to the right. So that's what that symbol is. Okay. Now the emperor symbol, if we look at this vase, and you notice these lovely chrysanthemum, chrysanthemum flowers, those are the symbol of the emperor in Japan. Um, where else have you seen that? Does anyone think of where else you may have seen that chrysanthemum? And if I've remembered to bring, uh huh. There you go. <laughs> Japanese passport. There you have it. That is the chrysanthemum. It has 12 petals traditionally, but of course, this one has 12 in the center and then more um, blooming from the outside. So the chrysanthemum was very important in Japan. It was the symbol of the emperor. It's on their passport, so very significant. There are chrysanthemum festivals, um, and traditionally, uh, people believe the chrysanthemum would bring you youth. And so if you would take the chrysanthemum oils and moisten your skin with it, it was like an anti-aging serum. So there was actually a festival, and I believe it was on the ninth day of the ninth month. And on this festival day, chrysanthemum was smeared over your face, and it, it brought you everlasting youth and beauty, according to um, tradition. So it's also the symbol of the emperor's throne. So the emperor's throne has a chrysanthemum flower on it. So again, very important symbol there as well. So I believe that concludes our art stop for today. We're out of time. Um, so thank you very much for coming, and I hope you have enjoyed.